right, I've got 530. So we've got a quorum, we will start the meeting. Uh, welcome everyone to the December 7th uh, Hadley School Committee meeting. Can't believe it's December already. Uh, is there a motion to call the meeting to order? I'm moved. Second. Second in. All in favor? Aye. 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 Kumara, I saw you motion that, but you were muted. So I just lip read that you motioned it too. All right. Um, adjustments to the agenda. I know we have one, which is uh, one that I know of, which is that we reference the second We do not have one uh, at the end tonight. Let me just make sure. That's correct. That's that was muted. Okay. Um, correct. We've been having that as a placeholder uh, as we do have negotiations um, coming up. So it is helpful to have that in our agendas in case we need that um, after our meeting, but we do not need one tonight. Um, so that is one adjustment. When we adjourn the meeting, we will uh, adjourn the meeting and not go into exec session. Are there any other adjustments for tonight? It could be that after the discussion of athletics that I um began talking about the data. Ms. Camuso uh, did send me a text. Unfortunately, her dog has run off in the dark. And so she's looking for her dog and she may be a little bit late. Okay, let's hope she finds her dog and that all is all right. And we will hold off on that until she is available. All right, any other adjustments? No. Okay. Um, with that, we will move then into public comment. We're just making sure we've got folks out of the waiting room in order to participate. Uh, a reminder about public comment, uh, it is available uh, for folks to um, comment publicly. It is not um, typically interactive. We don't uh, engage in Q&A as part of our public comment, but we do appreciate hearing from folks, hearing your... Oh, whoops, sorry. Sorry. That's okay. Um, hearing uh, things that you may want us to take into consideration prior to our presentation and discussion topics and prior to us um, obviously moving um, on action items. So uh, we've had some valuable public comment in the past. Um, we have found that holding this up front at the beginning of the meeting has worked well in re with respect to everybody's time um, and the ability to uh, have those public comments up front and front load those uh, so that we can consider those as we move into the topics. So with that, the way that we're doing it, again, as a reminder, is to raise your digital hand. I see some raised now, which is great. Um, public comment is uh, a three minute um, time frame, And so we ask that you do in the interest of just having everybody uh, have an opportunity to make public comment, uh, respect that time frame. Um, and should you wish to, uh, if we have a number of people wanting to make public comment and you want to make another public comment, we will wait until everybody's had a chance to speak. Uh, so with that, I will call on the first hand that I see up, which is Bob Wade. Uh, I will, I believe, ask you, to, or Annie, you may need to ask them to unmute so that Bob is able to speak with us. Or the account says Bob Wade, um, it may yep. not be Bob. <laughs> Hey, good evening. This is Bob Wade. Um, I'm just here to speak in support of Hopkins Academy holding their winter sport seasons as they are scheduled, of course, within uh, MIAA recommended guidelines. Um, I'm a Hopkins parent and my son has practiced and played basketball all summer and into the fall without um, any concerns and following guidelines. And he had a uh, a nice summer playing and without incident uh, regarding COVID. So I'm hoping that the school will go ahead with the winter seasons. That's all. Thank you very much, Bob. And yes, we're looking forward to uh, talking with Mr. Sudnick about those plans for the winter sports. So thank you. Okay, the next hand I see is uh, Aloisi. I believe that's Missy Aloisi. Yeah, uh, hi, can you hear me? Yes, okay. we can. I'm, I'm uh, Missy Aloisi, and I have two kids in Hopkins, uh, for anyone who doesn't know. And I wanted to just express um, the change uh, that we feel as parents. Um, we have decided we're going to keep our kids home um, until the next phase three of in-person. Um, 
they, we had a external COVID scare outside of the whole school committee and that was enough to really make them as students second guess the safety of going in, um, especially since we have one teacher. Um, I do believe that they've done everything possible to make it safe, but that's just um, an emotional reaction. Um, you know, it's brought about physical anxiety in, in my seventh grader. Um, and my son, who is a normally honor roll child, um, got his first non-passing grade this semester. And it, it was in combination of not studying. But I think that having such high stakes grading um, and not curving them towards the whole community in that class um, and not having weighted tests should be considered. Um, you know, my son in ninth grade now, um, straight A student, um, as far as English goes, um, on the honor roll every year, took creative writing summer camps. I don't know what, what many young boys that do that um, since fourth grade. And he got a non-passing grade in English. And uh, we had a great conversation with the teacher. But I do think that having a 65% grade, I get it that that's the high school policy. I just would like to see some consideration made in that during these COVID closed down times. Um, I think that's really affecting his morale and now he doesn't want to go into school. Um, and again, I, I know the teachers are working their butts off and I'm very, they're very supportive and helpful, but I do think some consideration should be made um, there for the whole community. Um, I also wanted to talk about or bring up the 12 to 2 p.m. Um, for the remote school people in the community. It's, I don't think it's a well used part of the time um, to expect, especially middle schoolers, to be um, on their own that much. Um, and so I think like the high stakes courses maybe should have more discussion, maybe extend their course time um, to have more discussion and reading out loud. Um, I have one student who is a, um, she listens and pays attention when people are talking to her. Um, but if you leave her on her own, um, she's just not that self-directed yet, whereas my ninth grader is. Um, so I think that those are two feedback I wanted to give um, in, a, in a whole. Um, and then I also, we also to support fall sports, um, winter sports, excuse me. Um, and that is it, thank you. Thank you, Missy. I appreciate you sharing, you know, your personal experiences yeah. um, and um, the context around that. We do appreciate hearing that. So thank you. Yeah, thank you. All right, next on the list, I see uh, Allison Willette. Allison. Hi, so it's uh, Addison here. Um, hey, Addie. Not Allie. Uh, Addie. Hello, my name is Edison Pfeiffer. Um, I'm a senior at Hopkins and I play on the boys varsity basketball team. Um, at Hopkins, sports have played a huge part in my school experience. Um, and I just wanted to express to you guys um, how much I would like to have uh, a winter season, but it's not really about my um, emotions. Uh, I have read the MIAA guidelines for winter sports this season, and I've played under them as well um, through AAU basketball, which is off-season basketball uh, this fall. Uh, I know it's possible to play under the restrictions. Uh, I've played with a mask on and like um, been supervised by health officials while playing and stuff, and uh, it worked out well. There were no, there were no problems with playing under the restrictions that I was playing under. Uh, and I believe that we can have a season that is both safe and rewarding for our basketball players. That's all. Thank you. Thank you very much, Addison. Appreciate hearing from you. Uh, next, we have Emily Pfeiffer. Hello, Emily. Hi, thanks. Um, so first, I, I just want to thank the district for choosing to keep the community updated about cases in the school population. I know it's not a requirement, 
So I especially appreciate this transparency. I wanted to send our best to the families who are affected by the latest cases. I know we have a couple of students and a faculty member. We are pulling for minimal illnesses and quick and complete recovery for them. Um, also, my compliments to the administration for the safety efforts and equipment that have been put in place. It really appears like the schools are doing well at maintaining strict protocols to mitigate spread, which is fantastic. I would like to know how the teachers feel it's going with adherence to the requirements, um, how they're doing in general, and how they feel the students are coping. Um, I, I understand that cases in the school population don't necessarily indicate school spread, don't indicate school spread. Um, however, I'm hoping to hear whether the schools are tightening those practices now that there are confirmed cases in the school population. I don't know if there are plans for deep cleaning, airing out rooms after classes or something else. I respect the need for privacy, but with the CDC's new guidelines saying exposure is cumulative 15 minutes over 24 hours, not just 15 minutes straight, it would help to understand which building and, and where there have been cases. Next, I want to keep a view on the remote experience, regardless of what's happening inside the buildings. Those of us who are able to keep our student at home reduce the risk for everyone in the building. I don't believe we have clear plans yet for how that might change um, if we do progress forward, but I, I implore the school committee to do what the state has failed to do and require that the administration make every effort to keep the remote experience as close to the quality of the in-person experience as possible. It won't be the same experience, but, but in quality as close as possible. Um, I, I don't think there's a requirement for synchronous time or quality of experience. So please establish that requirement for us. Uh, I don't understand how the teachers are juggling everything right now between remote and in-person. Um, I think they're possibly wizards. Um, it's incredible what they're doing, but if we do progress, it sounds like the kids at home can expect much less attention. Nearby districts are hiring remote only teachers. Please make sure the remote students continue to have that quality experience. And lastly, before we moved to this phase, I have been advocating for a clear path backwards as well, regressing phases if necessary, not just forwards. In our current data dashboard and weekly reviews, we reference the criteria for progressing to the next phase and we plan, the, the plans are called reopening plans. So I just strongly encourage the school committee to match the guardrails they've set up in both directions. What parameters would indicate the need to regress? It seems like a good idea to have a metric based plan for that as well. So there's something to lean on if it takes that turn. It takes the pressure off the committee having to just decide and it allows families to understand what's coming if they're watching the metrics. The dashboards are in place. So maybe to move backwards, it's something like any evidence of school transmission, automatic two week quarantine, right? If either of the other two metrics are above the currently established threshold for some period of time, like two weeks in a row, or if both are above at the same time, just to have something in place so that you have that to fall back on and everyone knows what to expect. That's all, thanks so much for everything you're doing. Thank you very much, Emily. And I think we will be hitting on some of the points that you raised when we talk about both the review of the public health data as well as the update on phase three um, and the remote experience as well as the in-person experience. So I, I do appreciate you raising those viewpoints too. Thank you. Great, okay. Um, looking at the list again, uh, if anyone would like to participate in public comment for this evening, please raise your digital hand. Okay, seeing none, uh, we will close public comment and move then into the presentations and discussion items. And I do see that Ms. Camuso was able to join us. So I do hope you found your dog. Uh, <laughs> excellent, good, thumbs up. All right, our first topic though is winter athletics update. Uh, Eric Sudnick. Good evening, everybody. How are we doing tonight? Eric, just so you know, you're a co-host, so you should be able to just share the screen if you'd okay, like. Okay, thank you. I, I did see you change that format. I was able to mute somebody to help you out, too. With the team. <laughs> so, trying my best here. Yeah. All right, well, good to see everybody tonight. Um, excited for the, uh, the proposition and the opportunity to talk about uh, the Winter Athletics Program at Hopkins that we're looking to field. Um, I've met with the administration of the school uh, last week. We went over our plan at length and brushed up on a few things and made a few adjustments. I, have, I feel like we have a pretty solid plan looking forward to what we were looking at for um, the winter athletic season. Um, I've also met with our the athletic directors in our conference earlier last week, as well as the athletic directors in our bubble that we're gonna to continue to try and utilize this winter uh, for 
our hosted sports here at Hopkins. So what I'll do is I'll share my screen. Um, a lot of the plan is going to look similar or the same as what we had for the fall because it's going to line up with the same expectations we have for the fall. And I'll try and move through that quickly and go on to the more important ones that would dictate what the winter would look like. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen at this point. Yep, we see your screen. All right. all right, so we're all set. Excellent. Thank you. Okay, so again, this is the Hopkins Academy of Winter Athletics outline plan for this upcoming anticipated season. Um, and again, I'm going to try and touch on, in the interest of time, what has been changed from the plan. So the beginning paragraphs, this is going to remain the same. The current dates and teams has been updated. So the new winter athletic season um, dates by the MIA were were changed. They were initially 11-30-2020. They were changed to 12-14-2020. And they were going to end at uh, February 21st, 2021. Uh, our conference has decided to make a move for safety and logistical and planning purposes uh, conference-wide to change the local start date. So instead of the MIA start date of 12-14, we are looking to start the winter athletic season on January 4th, uh, 21 while keeping the same end date of February 21st, 2021. Um, with all the logistical items as far as safe and healthy health concerns and getting the guidelines, hiring proper coaching staff, um, uh, looking at numbers and setting up teams and setting up facilities and with everything that has to be done, uh, as well as not only relying on what your school does, but what the other teams that are placed in your bubble, once bubbles are decided, once teams are approved to be played, with all that going on, it made sense to move the, um, the start date and make sure we were all on the same page and as prepared as possible to set for the winter season. So um, sports that we're looking at playing uh, that would be hosted or in a co-op at Hopkins Academy this winter would be basketball, uh, looking to do three levels, and I'll talk more about that in a few minutes. Uh, girls ice hockey, a co-op through Pope Francis. Boys ice hockey, and I'll talk about more about that in a second and swimming, uh, both boys ice hockey and swimming uh, for uh, girls and boys are both at Amherst High School. So I put some notes under boys ice hockey and I'll have further notes for girls ice hockey. Boys ice hockey, we've had a co-op for a few years we've, and co-ops typically last about two years. This is the end, this, this year would be the beginning of a new co-op with the current situation with Amherst and their sports programs and the numbers and who they're and what they're looking at doing currently after talking to their athletic director. Uh, we are not going to apply for our cup for boys ice hockey this year. So what that means is that only players who had previously participated in the boys ice hockey program could return to the hockey team for this upcoming season. So anybody who had participated at the JV or the varsity level for Amherst in the past could participate in the program as long as it was uh, it all set with Amherst. So what that does is we have a girls ice hockey co-op currently that's current. Um, the boys hockey, ice hockey one is no more at this juncture. Doesn't mean we can't apply for it again in the future, but it won't be applied for this year particularly. So what would happen since we only offer one program, it would be the girls ice hockey program that we co-op on a certified co-op through the MIA currently. So both girls and boys who had not had the opportunity to play at Amherst before and could return there could play at the girls ice hockey co-op at Pope Francis. So if you offer one sport or one level of sport or one gendered sport, you have to offer the opportunity to both genders regardless of if it's boys, girls, or otherwise. So, all right, so if anyone has any questions regarding that section, so that's what we're looking to approve uh, for this winter That's what we're looking to move forward with. Sports that have, are typically winter sports that are gonna be moved per the MIA are both the wrestling, which we have a co-op currently with Smith Vocational, and cheerleading, which we host each and every winter. So those are sports that have, are looking to have for the winter season, as well as sports that have been moved or affected by the updated MIA and EEA guidelines. So I'm gonna move on down. The participating athletics section remains the same. Um, it's just updating not only all the MI handbook and the athletic handbook and the student handbook stuff, 
um, but also making sure we have people understanding that all that we have outlined in the winter athletic plan, which we're reading currently, is um, to be expected to be followed during the athletic season. So when we're looking at practice schedules, uh, practice schedules and areas to be used, or practice spaces, I should say, and areas to be used, um, at this point, we're only looking to use the Hopkins Academy Gymnasium. Uh, it makes sense to limit the amount of places that our student athletes are going and being around and that we have to sanitize and that we have sanitation issues. So at this point, I believe we can make it work using just the Hopkins Academy Gymnasium. So scrolling down further. So what we're looking at as far as the plan for basketball, which is the sport that we would host here at Hopkins, is looking at doing a varsity and JV level programs as well as a middle school program, but only looking to do interscholastic games at both the varsity and the JV season of our both the varsity and JV teams at boys and girls level. So uh, we finalized this decision talking the other day with our with our bubble, which I'll talk more about that in a second. Um, but looking at the fact that we during the fall we didn't know if we were able to get. Having an issue sharing my screen here. There we go. Uh, is everyone able to see my screen still? Yes. Okay, thank you. Sorry, I had a little technical yeah. difficulties there. So, uh, when we looked at the fact that uh, this fall we had only looked at doing varsity level athletics interscholastically and that we were going to try and do JV. Uh oh. I think somebody, Andy's trying, someone's trying to. Yeah, take we got to pick somebody here. Okay. <laughs> Wait, what's happening? I'm confused. Um, someone's controlling my screen. Oh, okay. Um, if you want, I can I can help you. Yeah, let's. Uh, yeah, someone's controlling my screen. <laughs> nope. Someone said Andy McKenzie was trying to control my screen or something to that effect. Yeah, no. Did, uh, did we get, are we all set? Yeah, you should just walk us through it, I think. Okay. Yeah, keep, keep going, Eric. Right. I'll help monitor yeah. this. Yeah, no problem. All right. So, um, so as I was saying, last fall, we were only looking at doing um, varsity level interscholastics. We believe with the current setup in our Franklin County bubble that we're going to look to do, that we could do a varsity and JV setup. And I'll talk more about that in a few minutes. So girls and boys teams would be a maximum of 15 players per team, uh, maybe reduced if logistically necessary. Um, and what we're looking at doing is the varsity and the JV teams playing back-to-back -back games or within reason back-to-back -back games, allowing time for sanitation and all the logistical uh, things we need to do for the COVID guidelines, but doing them opposite sites. So if, for example, the Hopkins girls JV and varsity team were traveling to Greenfield, then the Hopkins boys JV and varsity would play at home versus Greenfield. So we're doing opposite sites for the gendered teams to allow to maximize practice times on the other days and to make it work logistically for the whole, um, for the whole gamut. Uh, practice spaces and times haven't been determined and they won't be determined until we look at the number of participants we have and at what level we're able to field. Um, and currently at this time, we're we want to do middle school. I would like to do middle school and get everybody involved to the best that we can, depending on numbers, because if numbers are lower and we're only fielding two teams, we to field a varsity and a JV team. So, um, basketball trainings will have coaching staff um, take place in organized groups by level. So what that's going to mean is we'll have, especially for the high school, um, when you're starting to determine teams, um, they'll have to, they will have to be, um, all grouped together at some point, but then when the JV and the varsity teams are separated, they will have separate practice times or separate practice spaces based off of cohort guidelines. Cohort guidelines are, um, similar to the fall. Uh, they actually, I believe they're almost exactly the same as the fall. So no larger than 10 participates in a cohort, cohorts are separated by 14 feet and no event should have more than 25 people on a playing surface at one time. So those are just things we need to keep in mind when doing uh, practices and games. All right, and that stuff I'll work out with the coaching staff. Um, so moving on, uh, attendance that will be the same 
uh, attendance will be tracked by the coaches and the athletic and uh, the record will be maintained by myself. So that's the same as that we did for the fall, which worked out quite well for all fall sports. Uh, the risk levels have remained the same. The COVID guidelines, health and safety, that would be remaining the same as far as the expectation for if they were found to um, have been were exposed to COVID, they wouldn't participate or practice or they wouldn't participate in practice or games until 14 day quarantine is, complete, is completed. Um, and just some guidelines regarding if they have a temperature or signs and symptoms that they should not be attending practices or games, okay? Uh, students and coaches um, are not going to access the locker rooms. We're only gonna use those when absolutely necessary. So the expectation is gonna be that students should come dressed to any practice or uh, game. Okay, so we're gonna stay out of locker rooms as much as possible. Um, if there's very extenuating circumstances, we'll do it on a case-by-case -case basis, but the expectation will be that we don't use the locker rooms aside from restrooms if they're needed, so. Okay, so to looking at specific sports. So basketball has been identified as a high-risk sport, which means that to participate at the, at the lowest level of the EA guidelines uh, and to participate at level two and level three, but with the modified guidelines that the state has put in place, uh, once again, the MIA and the individual sports committees did an excellent job putting together the guidelines for the MIA sports. Um, I was pleasantly surprised to see that a lot of basketball was able to remain the same um, and not really take away from the integrity of what makes basketball such a great sport um, while trying to do things um, logistically and a few things um, in game to make it as safe as game as possible. Um, if you look down at the list, and I won't go through every single one of them, um, and I just did these um, very quick and these, you know, kind of quick cryptic notes just to kind of give people a sense of what been changed basketball if they're familiar with the sport. Um, and the full guidelines are actually farther down than the 2021 COVID basketball notifications. You can see all the ones for basketball at the MIA Sport Committee put together. Um, but actually, most of the um, guidelines that they set we're actually more something that I or the coaching staff are gonna to have to be concerned with as opposed to referee in game situations. Um, things of uh, adjustments for pregame and warmups and introductions and the yeah, anthem being played, but no singing. Um, unfortunately, and a, a huge sad day would be, um, or a huge sad thing to hear for me personally and, and, and a lot of student bodies, our pet band would not be allowed to play. They are not currently allowing indoor um, music at events and pep band has always been one of my favorite parts of, of being an athletic director at the school. So uh, sad, sadly, we won't be able to have them this year, but we'll, again in the future and I look forward to them returning. Um, no post-game handshakes. Uh, they're not gonna do half times. It'll be uh, four quarters with sanitizing the ball between quarters. Uh, time is slightly extended to allow for social distancing while the coach is uh, addressing the players. Um, and again, Many, many like logistical event based uh, guidelines that I would need to follow and my site managers would need to follow to make sure the event was as safe as possible for all the student athletes. Um, so that's, that's pretty much it. Um, and if anyone would like to have, ask specific questions regarding the guidelines, I'll be happy to explain them. Um, for major game ones, uh, for the free throw um, lineup at the free throw were modified, only allowing two offensive and two defensive players, and then the person shooting. So that's been changed. And then inbounding underneath someone's basket at the basket they're going at has been removed to uh, have students less time and uh, spaced tightly around the basket. So trying to get an effort to stay away from that. So, so I'm gonna move on, uh, talk a little bit about co-op sports. So uh, girls ice hockey at Pope Francis has been approved by both Pope Francis and the administration at the school. Uh, it's been identified as higher risk, uh, but there's a, been a series of guidelines and steps that not only Pope Francis is putting in place for their program when they host, but uh, as you can see before, there's um, rank guidelines that have been set and have been very strict and standardized and have proved to be effective in a lot of cases um, for the ranks. They've, they've done a really good job with those. So um, as I talked about before, with the girls ice hockey co-op, um, it would be a co-ed co-op for that sport this year in particular because of the situation regarding the lack of co-op this year for the boys ice hockey Amherst program. All right, moving on to that program specifically, um, I've been 
in constant communication with the athletic director, Victoria Stewart from Amherst. Um, she's trying to keep me updated as much as soon as she can regarding their situation. Uh, they were to vote on their co-ops and their sports the other day, but the a decision had been tabled to a meeting this week. As soon as I have more information regarding that topic, I will uh, make sure I share it and communicate with the public and uh, you know make the decisions we need to as far as the school and to get our students any and all opportunities that we are able to. So again, the boys ice hockey, that's going to be for students this year who are grandfathered in under the previous co-op. So anyone who's played on the, on the hockey team with Amherst previously will be allowed to and will continue to be allowed to play with that team for the remainder of their high school career, okay? They won't miss an opportunity because the co-op had not been renewed if they had previously played. Girls and boys swimming. Um, we had started that co-op last year and it had gone really well and I was excited for our student athletes to take part in that. That is also something we are waiting on from the Amherst uh, administration and school committee to make a decision regarding that. And as soon as I have more information regarding that co-op, I will uh, communicate that to the public. So thanks for your patience on those. Mask expectations have been adjusted. So when we had talked about this this fall with uh, the outdoor sports, when the expectation was that students were to wear a mask uh, most of the time, almost all the time, but they were able to uh, when 10 feet apart and with the expectation being they were typically wear their mask, they were able to move their mask slightly to catch their breath, you know, on the soccer field or they could pull down their mask on the, on the cross country course. But so the expectation was typically that you wear the mask, but you were allowed those mask breaks in game. Uh, currently, the expectation is that they wear masks for basketball the whole time and that when they come off the court, there are mask break area, areas that we will designate on the sides of the court near where the benches will be or their bleachers will be, which I'll talk more about that in a second. Um, and um, that is where they're supposed to have the mask, break, mask breaks. They're not supposed to uh, take a break, an informal break during the game. It should be, excuse me, subbed out and then uh, take a formal break and then return to play or return to the spot on the bench um, and return to the game when they're able. So, so that's a, a change with a mask wearing. Um, pre and post events, that has been the, that will remain the same. You know, coach, uh, students, should, these students should not be showing up in, in the building earlier than when the coaches are there. When we go in, we do the event, and then we uh, leave in a timely fashion, we go hanging around and, and socializing. Um, to minimize the amount of interaction uh, for the student athletes and the people attending. So our scheduled opponents for our hosted programs, our basketball programs are gonna remain the same um, with the fact that we're also, Smith Academy is looking to do basketball this winter as well. They did not participate in sports uh, this fall, unfortunately for their school. Um, so they are the only addition. Uh, we'd still be, we're still looking at playing Greenfield, Turner's Falls, Mahar, Athol, Franklin Tech, Frontier, Pioneer, Mohawk, and Smith Academy. And uh, so that would what our interscholastic schedule for basketball would look like. This does not apply for co-op sports. Co-op sports would be based off um, other teams in the conference that were allowed and able to schedule by, the, the, by our um, conference, the PBIAC. Um, that hasn't been officially decided yet because school systems are still looking at approving and saying which sports they will participate in. So I could not tell you who uh, the boys ice hockey team or the girls Pope Francis ice hockey team will be playing at this point because it has not been officially decided as it's being molded um, as schools get approved or not approved. So I'll continue to communicate that as, uh, as it goes on. But uh, there will be no MIA tournaments. That remains the same for this winter. The MIA made that decision already. So there will be no MIA tournaments. We have discussed doing a Franklin County bubble uh, championship um, in kind of a eight team, three day championship that would be under, that would be okay under the guidelines um, at the end of the winter season. So that is being um, discussed and trying to be formulated. We're going to actively push for that. It would be under the same format as playing a single game. So that would, expectation, expectation would not be, be played. It would just be under the um, expectation that uh, there would be looking to be a, uh, a champion crowned uh, at the end of the three three day um, event. So, so looking at home games and comp competition attendance, the 
there is guidelines regarding attendance at events, but per our discussion with our um, Franklin County Athletic Director's bubble that we're going to be playing in, the push was to maximize the amount of events that we could get for our student athletes, um, even at the even if spectators were not able to attend because we were able to do so. So with the fact that we're going to look to do varsity and JV uh, events. Um, there will be no spectators because the space that is going to be used in the gymnasium will be taken up by all the teams that are participating. So with the fact that we're looking to do um, interscholastic events for both the varsity and the JV, and I already started looking at doing this for our gym, um, we're looking to use specific zones in the gym for each team to not only uh, use as their bench, for the game, but also for their viewing area for if they're viewing a, the previous game or the game that is to follow. So for an away game, or for a home game, I should say, we would have an area designated, one of the bleachers, uh, designated for our varsity team, one designated for our JV team, and one bleacher designated for the visiting varsity team, and one bleacher to, uh, excuse me, designated for the visiting JV team. What that would do, it would allow the students to be socially distanced um, in a safe environment while they watch the game previous, um, especially for the visiting teams who might be traveling on the same bus. Um, and then we would use that same area as their bench, uh, which will look different uh, for the winter season for their game when they participate. Um, I did do some measurements on our bench and using six foot distances, or our bleachers, I should say, it's going to be pseudo bench. Um, I was able to fit 17 people socially distance out, which would be the maximum limit of our players, 15 on a team, with even two coaching staff if we had two coaches, if it was a varsity and the JV coaching, a coach helping out at that particular game, if that was the case, or the varsity assistant, the JV coach, if necessary. So um, there would be plenty of space to make this work. It would maximize the opportunity for our students. And that is the direction we're going to be looking to move forward to get our students active and engaged and uh, have a successful winter season. So that is the direction we're going in right now uh, for all the schools that can host that opportunity, which we would be one. The away games and transportation guidelines remain the same. Uh, we will provide transportation for away games safely to do so within the district guidelines. If it takes, if we have the ability to fit students on one bus for an away game and it made sense, we would. Uh, for cost purposes, but if if we would require two buses, we would uh, look into doing that with the minimal number of games um, where we can make that work. Um, and we still have, and at, I know I followed this up at a second school committee meeting, uh, updating the fall, with that we had introduced the athletic student transport form. So if, uh, parents or guardians were interested in transporting their own student athlete, they just fill out the form and they can transport them to the way games on their own. So. Finally, the contract, the, excuse me, the contact tracing piece remains the same. Um, if there was an issue at an event, we would follow all school and district guidelines regarding uh, protocols, and I will have contact information based off each and every member of both the home and the visiting group, uh, all the way down to all of our uh, staff members who are staffing the games, scoreboard operators, anybody who would run the camera, uh, which I, I will mention. I know we, I forgot to mention when I talked about no spectators, um, I'm going to work with the Hadley Town Media to secure their camera system to make sure that we're taping each game and they have done an excellent job uploading all their games to uh, the town website so anyone can view them. Um, I can also look into possibly live streaming the game. We cannot through um, the Hadley um, Town Media venue like that we can only tape and then post after. But um, I will look into a possibility of live stream. I don't know how the quality would be or anything of that nature, but um, I'll certainly look into it to maximize the opportunity for people to view the games. So, but that's all I have as far as that's going on that point. Um, so yes, uh, but contact tracing, as I was speaking to a second ago before I reintroduced the, uh, the video piece, um, yeah, we would have all the protocol set in place to make sure everyone was communicated with effectively in a timely fashion in case there was uh, an issue of any nature. So that is the winter athletics plan. I appreciate everyone's time. Uh, as I walk us through the athletics plan for this winter, I think it's a sound plan and I think uh, we can safely have our student athletes 
um, were would, you know, participate in an event that they worked so hard uh, to and look forward to all year. And um, at this point, if anyone has any questions or clarification pieces regarding the plan, I'd be happy to to talk to anybody who would have questions. So thank you. And thank you for the opportunity to come talk to you tonight. I, as always, I appreciate it. I know you have a lot going on. Thank you for the information, Eric. It was very thorough and appreciate, you know, reading through the plan and all the attention to detail. Um, I just had one question. I'm sure others may have questions too, but the date shift, right? The start date shift is really a result of the conference that we are going to be keeping within and their need to shift. Uh, so we're starting with them. Is that correct? Correct. So when we tried to do this this fall, um, and when I say conference, there's, there's our conference and there's our bubble. So the conference that we meet with regularly is our Pioneer Valley Interscholastic Athletic Conference. That's like 60 schools throughout the Pioneer Valley um, that we formulate leagues and that every four years we realign and do new leagues with. So as, a, as that conference, we made the decision to move to um, January 4th for the start date. Looking back at trying to make everything work in such a short time frame for the fall, when decisions were made by the MIA and the guidelines coming out and then schools getting approved versus when we started with the MIA start date then, there was a lot of issues setting up and keeping bubbles going for the conference overall. And all the athletic directors agreed having more time, especially with it being indoors and the proximity and the logistical, um, the amount of logistical steps you have to take um, with a, you know indoors versus outdoors and on, on shorter notice and we, it made sense to, to move to the January 4th start date. With the January 4th start date, we are still going to follow uh, the expectation of 10 days of practice before you participate in your first game. That's an MIA standard that's been built in um, each and every season, uh, regardless of uh, pre-COVID or not, um, to make sure students are physically able and healthy enough to participate in a, uh, a full athletic endeavor. So that will be followed through with and, and monitored. And uh, so we're looking to, for the basketball season, uh, look to do 10 games. And then, as I had said, depending on the schedule uh, or the, the record of a team, the top eight teams, we would try to do like a mini tournament for the bubble at the end to give student athletes a, a, a moment and a, and a place to, to have their achievements recognized if they were being very successful that year, so. Got it, thank you. You're very welcome. Hey, thanks, Eric. I just uh, thank you for the well thought through uh, uh, advice here and the, the proposal. Just a couple of questions. So you said 10, 10 games. Are all those other teams committed in our bubble? Have they committed to play too? So that's that's another reason why waiting for the January 4th start date, right? So we meet as a conference. We meet as our bubble. Now schools have to get approved by each individual school district to make sure that you can then have that plan go ahead. So you come up with a plan and then you give a little bit of time. So we're going to meet back up with um, our Franklin County Athletic Directors group a little uh, next week, week and a half, just to see where everybody is. And then when everyone, we see who's been approved and what timelines are looking like, then I'll get the official schedule out. I'm actually going to work with one of their ADs to make the schedule and then we'll get it posted on the MIA site once we have all the schools who are approved. Thanks. So yeah. maybe I could clarify, Heather, Annie, this isn't in front of the school committee for vote, right? No, it's not an action item for us, but um, we did talk about, you know, when we were approving sports initially, just wanting to hear about different seasons, agreed. Yeah. And then, so of course, I'm disappointed to hear no spectators. I get it. So the, the reason, in, reason is, again, that essentially the JV and the varsity teams will be spread all the way across the gym. Very Correct. Important. So if, if you, if you, for anyone who's seen our gym, there's four big sets of bleachers. And those are essentially going to be team benches because while players are on benches, they have to be six feet apart. And my plan is to use the bleachers uh, as their viewing area for a previous game or if they already played the game, they're gonna, you know, to, for, for watching as well as those will be, they'll have specific bench area on a well, specific seating area on the bleacher for each student. So each and every game, Addison Pfeiffer would know where he's sitting for both viewing the game if, at the JV game or um, 
a bench spot if he wasn't in the game during the varsity game. So we would keep those areas, we'd keep the student equipment because it's supposed to be spaced out in the same area. And by doing that, it allows all those groups to stay in the same area to allow us to have two levels of interscholastic play as opposed to simply the varsity level of play. So we're maximizing the opportunity for our student athletes. And again, all the games will be taped and I'm gonna, I'll do my best to look into some sort of live streaming. Um, I, I've never done that before, but I don't know if with a tablet, if you, if you Facebook live streamed it or something, you know, just thinking out loud, if that's an opportunity to get viewership up and, and uh, try and have people be able to, to view the game to the best we can. So. Yeah, I'm sure you can get some volunteers to do that because you know, we could figure that out and we'd be happy to help. Um, I'm sure you'd have volunteers, not just to film, but you're probably going to need some crew to be in there to help keep score and things like that for these events. And, you know, one thought too, I'll be sad not to have the pep band either. They're, they're awesome. Um, you know, one thought just taking a lesson from some of the pro sports, it's hard to play competitive in a, in a quiet competitive sports in a quiet building. So, you know, maybe allow space for one person in there to play music to keep the energy going, no matter what the sport is. Um, yeah, they, and, and- Is it playing music so, physically or you can't play it? You can play a radio. Come on, you're not gonna disturb COVID with a radio. That's, right? a, that's a good question. Now, the, <laughs> there's all sorts of MIA rules traditionally regarding noise during games. And I wonder if they wouldn't mo allow us to modify that. I don't know if you can, you know, have crowd I'm noise. Not during, like, during play. I'm saying crowd it's like, noise. Just, just replace the the pep band with yeah with the DJ essentially. With the DJ, yeah. yeah. <laughs> there we go. Yeah, no, no, no vocalized or no formal no like, instruments, yeah. right? Me. Unless so, you want to so, sing, if you want to sing, Eric, we could we could fill you in for well, that. I don't want everyone's uh, ears to bleed in the in the gymnasium <laughs> with my, my my shrill voice. Um, and I'm no Donna Bird. I I could not do it just oh, thank you. Thank you. So, but th th that is actually an interesting question. Um, no one's posed that so far as pumping in any sort of noise or crowd noise or music or anything like that. Um, yeah. But that's a good thought. No, and, and we have, we certainly have to, to, do to, to DJ, DJ for us. There we go. So, <laughs> just to be clear for the, the, the ice hockey again. So since the co-op with Amherst uh, ended and the girls co-op with uh, Pope Francis continues, the boys will have the opportunity to co-op with Pope Francis as well. Correct. So for an example, for another example, and this is where I first ran across this, Years ago, um, Amherst was looking for a boys lacrosse opportunity, a co-op. Their girls team had more than enough players to field two, at least two levels of varsity and JV. So, and co-ops are based off, for the most part, uh, varsity level survival. They're supposed to be for survival varsity teams. So with the fact that we only had a boys varsity lacrosse team, girls could play on the team. All right. So, and... So technically, girls from Amherst could not play on the boys' varsity lacrosse team, but girls from our school could have played because they offered two teams. We only offered one. And the same goes for any sports, wrestling, football, field hockey. Any time that it, only one sport is offered by your school, you have to be able to offer it to everybody at the school. You can't, stand, you can't discriminate. Um, so... So, yep, the, so if anyone, and, and I just wanted to make it clear, anyone who had previously played on the boys' varsity ice hockey team is grandfathered in, and they would be able to continue to play with that program. That's the way it works to not cut students out who have dedicated themselves to the program already um, and allow them the opportunity to continue to do that. So when you say continue to hope, play with them. My other hope is, I'm sorry, just one more thing, is that um, I think one of the reasons we didn't apply for the co-op is um, Victoria was unsure of what her numbers or what, kind of program she was going to field this this winter so it didn't make sense to apply for a co-op on a program she was unsure of what the program would look like so um that is why we chose to hold off and not apply this year but it does not uh, preclude us from applying in the future but again that would be dependent on varsity level numbers at amherst or any other school we had no uh, co-op with that's how that works all right, I'm sorry, just a bit confused. So if you're an existing varsity level boys hockey player from Hopkins, yep. where will you play next year if you want, or this winter if you want to play? As long as Amherst approves um, ice hockey, boys ice hockey, they could continue to play at Amherst. They could not only play there this year, but for the rest of their career. They could play out the rest of their career for their, the school. And if Amherst doesn't offer ice hockey? 
then the only other opportunity at this point would be to participate in the girls ice hockey co-op with Pope Francis because we don't have another co-op opportunity. I see. Okay. Thank you. So, and again, Victoria, um, she's been trying to keep me in the loop as much as she can regarding that it was tabled at the previous school committee meeting. So she has no further information. Um, and I, I, I don't want to hesitate to guess. I'd like to think that we can move forward and it will be okay. And, um, I know we're on board to, to move forward. Uh, from our viewpoint. Great, thanks. Yeah, I'm definitely supportive of it and I appreciate the public comments that we got tonight as well. Um, you know, I think there's a lot of thought that's been put into this plan, uh, adherence to all of the health and safety measures while still also trying to return, you know, some semblance of a season uh, to the kids. So that's much appreciated. Yeah, and I, I would like to say uh, with the guidelines we followed during the fall for both the soccer clinics that we did as well as the golf and the cross country program, I thought it was a tremendous success uh, for us being able to do what we could. Um, I know the students were happy to be out there. The coaches were ecstatic to be out there. Um, we even did a, a sports banquet online, Zoom meeting, celebrating the athletes for the fall. I mean, with all the modifications you put in place and with everything going on, it still felt like a big win uh, seeing the students engaged and active and smiling and social and, and you know, coaches doing their thing. And uh, it, was, it was a really nice experience and I was glad we were able to do it. So I, I once again want to thank the school committee for allowing us the opportunity and we'll continue to treat our students uh, the best we can, as safe as we can, and uh, get them those opportunities to get that social and outlet that they are so craving. So thank you very much. I just want to add that um, when we first reviewed MI's plan, it was um, it was such a stark contrast uh, how they had their act together um, in terms of uh, careful review of uh, each sport, each circumstance, uh, each individual's role. I I did an exhaustive review of that document when they first circulated it, and I it, it just. Uh, you know, having no guidance on the non-sport side of things, it really um, struck me uh, that they are taking great care in um, providing um, the right circumstances to make this happen. And I appreciate your and the rest of your team's ability to um, adhere to those to keep our kids safe. Thank you very much, yeah. The, the sport committee is our, for the MIA, are actually made up of athletic directors throughout the state. I'm on the golf committee for our region, and uh, they do a tremendous job, you know, taking the time and effort. And they even do, uh, they even host what they call town halls, where after the guidance comes out, they allow principals, uh, superintendents, and athletic directors to attend a town hall where they can ask questions for their clarifying guidelines. Um, I was unable to attend the basketball one. Because uh, I had, I was actually taking a class of my own that night, taking class at Springfield College. So, um, but uh, I was able to view it after when there were some great questions and great discussion. And you can tell people to put a lot of time and effort, um, not only with the athletic directors, but consulting officials involved. Um, because another thing people don't often think about is officials might be hesitant to, to referee games um, over a season, the fall, winter, or what have you. Um, and by allowing us to do the back-to-back -back games that we're going to try and do under our current format uh, allows us to have officials for both sides. We would use officials, the same set of officials for both games is how we've been discussing it with um, the officials board uh, coordinator so for our district. So That's thank great. you very much. I appreciate it. Great. Any other feedback or questions from the committee? Just thank you. You're very welcome. It's my pleasure. Anything we can do to help out our students, I'm on board for, so. Yeah, thank you very much, Eric. Yeah. Thank you. All right, well, we're looking forward to that and uh, looking forward to hearing how everything goes. Thank you very much, I'm sure. Great. I'll be talking to you again when fall two is coming up. <laughs> yeah, that's right. I'll be here before we know it, thank you. Okay, thanks, Eric. Um, we're gonna move now to the update on phase three. Ms. Camuso. Thank you. So I just have a very brief update for everyone tonight. I'm gonna to be back on the 21st for a full presentation uh, and hopefully we will be 
done completely at that point. That is, that is the hope and in agreement around what that might look like. Right now, I've been working with a team at revising some schedules and assignments. We've taken feedback from the faculty and from parents and students. We didn't send out a survey to parents and students, although the survey I sent today to students addresses some of this. Um, but we've gotten a lot of feedback from them in other means in regard to what they're looking for. And in general, I know that families are looking for a little bit more face-to-face -face time if their students return to in-person. I know that everyone wants to be safe and we know that teachers uh, are really trying to be six feet apart still with students. And I think that was a question back in August that I think um, was asked about how much, you know, whether we could really get to that six feet. So that's the plan that we've been working on to get to the six feet and to have that face-to-face -face time with less mixing if possible, but spread over time. So in the current phase three plan, students are moving through all of their classes in one day, right, in that original plan. And we're now looking at a different plan that takes more of a block approach. So we're looking at what that means in terms of room assignments and how students are able to move and finding the appropriate locations. And that just involves a little bit of uh, really close analysis and planning on our part. So as we finish that up, we should be done with that this week and we'll take that back to the faculty for some review and the union. Um, and then hopefully I'll be able to tell you guys a bit more specifically after that. I did send out a survey today to students about remote learning at this point. It did ask some questions as well about phase three. And when we're done with that phase three plan, I'd like to get a little feedback from families as well as to what they think of our new revised plan. Um, but I guess until then, I won't say too much more, but if you guys have questions or comments or things you'd like me to take back to the team, I am meeting with them tomorrow to be working on that. So I'd be happy to answer what I can and to take any of that back to them. Thanks, April. I think my only comment, and I'm looking forward to, to reviewing that phase three draft, um, and I think we heard it tonight in the public comment, and you've heard it from us previously too, is as part of that phase three plan, just the attention to the remote learners for those who do continue to, to learn remotely, um, how they will be supported. I think that in order to really get um, good feedback from families that's clear, uh, they'll need to understand what phase three looks like for their child who is in person as contrasted to what phase three would look like as uh, for their child in a remote setting. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Um, maybe you said it and I didn't hear it right too. Um, I think we had talked to um, about having uh, a survey go out just to get an idea of how many kids would plan on coming back. Maybe that's what you mean when you send out the survey after the 12-21 date. Yeah, we talked about that and uh, someone had asked about doing that earlier on the faculty and I said I'd rather wait until we had more about what phase three will look like so that families can say this is what it looks like. Am I going to come back for this plan? What happened in phase two is there was a little bit of confusion about that. And then we had a lot of families last minute say, never mind, I don't want to be a part of that plan. So I think being clear with them about this is what the plan is going to look like and do you want to participate. So again, I'm hoping I can send that out uh, right before winter break, but if not, as soon as we return to get that information from them. Great. I had two other things that are not necessarily particular to April, but more about the whole school whenever we're done with April before we move on to public health data too. But I'll give anybody else that wants to comment. Go ahead, Tara. Um, just two things that I, I that kind of came up that made me think. Um, one of them was mentioned in public comment too about um, social emotional wellness of the students. Um, and so I am, I, and I know I've brought this up a lot before and we talked about it last time too, um, keeping in touch with parents, uh, not parents, excuse me, teachers within the district to kind of keep touch on how things are going. But I, I'm wondering if a more um, 
formal slash informal survey to teachers would be helpful um, just to get an idea um, how things are going within each school. I think it's beneficial at both schools if that's not something that was just done at Hopkins. Um, but the elementary school too, um, from the teacher's perspective, and I guess my thought for thinking a little further about it rather than just kind of an informal discussion with HEA or just feedback is in case teachers um, feel the need to express something that they might not feel comfortable bringing up otherwise. So we have an opportunity for them to provide information, um, targeted questions, but then allowing for comments or feedback in an anonymous way that they might feel comfortable saying something that they otherwise wouldn't. Um, and I think figuring out you know, where we stand as far as social emotional wellness with these students now that we've been back for X number of weeks from a teacher's perspective would be really useful to make sure that we're still moving in the right direction um, and that we're helping them in every way that we can. So that's just one thought. The other thing that came up and it's, I. I don't know how it relates, but, and I haven't read it yet, I'm gonna confess, but there's an article in the Boston Globe um, and the title of it, and I'm happy to send it, but I don't know if, if you don't have Boston Globe, you can't access it. Um, schools confront off the rails, quote unquote, numbers of failing grades. So I guess from administration's perspective, are we looking at report cards, like an aggregate of report cards for how kids did this first term compared to like an average year? Um, because what this article is citing, and again, I didn't, I didn't read it all, so um, I can't state exactly, but it's stating, you know, that the number of failing grades are at a much, much higher rate on a national level this year. Not necessarily understand, it's understandable. Um, so I'm just curious if we're looking at that and making sure that grades that we have now after first quarter are on par with what we would expect to see without COVID present. So Tara, I can respond to what the district will be looking at in terms of aggregate data across both schools. Um, the administrators, this is something that's front and center on our minds. And so doing a comparison, what you just described, I don't have that data for you this evening, but it is data that we were already intend, uh, intended to get and to analyze. And so that would be looking at percentage of students failing one or more courses in the aggregate compared to this time last year and uh, currently, and then uh, disaggregating that data based on uh, the experience of academic progress, uh, remote versus in person. That's not really an apples to apples because there isn't really, there's an in-person support option at Hopkins, but there isn't really an in-person instruction option. But certainly um, it's worthwhile to look at the difference in academic experience and social emotional experiences for students at both campuses because the percentage of students in in-person learning is almost exactly the opposite, right? It's about 80% in-person at the elementary, 20% remote. It's just about the opposite of that at Hopkins Academy. And then disaggregating that data further by um, various demographic groups. Um, to see if we see disproportionate rates of failure or disengagement. Disengagement would be defined as obviously feedback, attendance, um, tardies are applicable when you have different periods like at Hopkins, um, and certainly uh, work completion rates. Obviously without identifiers, but are you able to report back to us how we're looking once that's- Yeah, out? yeah, no, I'll-, I'll do what we love to do, which is, um, I don't know if I'll be about sharing any screens on presentations. I'm kind of over that after tonight, but um, I'll figure out a way to make sure that people see the, see the data. Um, yes, absolutely. That's a big question about, again, looking at it in the aggregate and then uh, disaggregating it uh, based on instructional model and uh, different demographic groups. Thank you. Excellent. Can I just jump in? That's a good, those are good questions, Tara. Thanks. The, um, just also, you know, we, we heard previous talk about how teachers are feeling so strapped because they're having to do the remote and in-learning. And I know you, at Jen, and at April were thinking about that. Any ideas or anything that the school committee can help with in that regard? So one thing I was going to suggest is even uh, I've the discussion about uh, survey or getting particular feedback so the way that we can do this rather expeditiously is if um, the chair is comfortable with me 
uh, reaching out to the school committee. And then if I, the superintendent, identify two people who might be interested in helping to design that survey, because it sounds like there's specific information that folks might be looking for. If I um, make that appointment and that's not subject to uh, um, open meeting and we don't, it doesn't require a quorum of the school committee to have a discussion as to simply what questions might be in that survey and how that data, how those data are collected. If um, you're comfortable with that, Heather, I could proceed that way. And Paul, I believe that that would get at what you're asking, which is that question of um, what are some of the needs that the faculty and staff might have, as well as what is their feedback? Yeah, I'm supportive of it. I think too, you know, we've, we've heard some folks here um, and outside of this forum volunteer as resources given their, um, you know, professional lives outside of school committee. So I think that that's something that, um, it, however we can help mm -hmm. uh, or, or suggest additional resources, we want to do that. I think you know that that offer is there. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. Great. Well, thank you again, April and Tara. I, I agree. I, I appreciate you raising those points that you did. Any other um, uh, feedback or questions on just the update for phase three before we move into the data? Okay. Um, let's re move into the review of public health data. And um, I do think just given you know, uh, the feedback that we've received, the, um, the kudos also about the transparency that there is here in terms of communication, right, with, within our district, with our families about the current situation or the status of uh, COVID cases within our school community. Um, I know it's appreciated and I think that, you know, coupling the review of the data with just a, a commentary on how, you know, what is the response? If, what is our response, if any, to local cases, anything that may be um, warranting extra attention in terms of cleaning procedures? Those are some of the questions that I think folks have just wondered um, that this may be a forum to be able to help share. Sure, so in terms of, just in terms of where we are at with the data, so I sent, uh, by design, I sent out the superintendent update this morning so that the community would see this morning in advance of this meeting what the most recent data, um, what we see in the most recent data. So the average daily incidence rate from the county went down very slightly from 19.3 last week to 18.6 this week. The testing positivity rate increased from 1.16% to 1.48%. Um, and uh, the case count in Hadley is at 68. Uh, we have had uh, now in the last two weeks, a staff and two students representing a total of two unique households. Those are the three positive cases we've had of people who are attending buildings in person. On any given day currently, there are roughly 383 people in the district, adults and children on any given day. That has been the case since October 26th. Um, since August 27th, we've had all faculty in. Um, that's roughly 130 people in the district on any given day. Beginning September 14th, we added approximately 120 students, uh, bringing that total to 250. And then on October 26th, we added additional students, now bringing the total count of faculty, staff, and students on any given day, again, to roughly about 200, uh, 383. And in that time period, we're on it about uh, September, October, November, about three and a half months. Again, we've seen three positive cases representing two unique households. So um, while I would prefer that we have zero cases, I certainly would prefer that. I did say in the summer that um, we should be pre prepared for the fact that we will have positive cases, um, just like every business and communities, that we will have positive cases. 
I am heartened to see that the mitigation strategies that we have in place appear to be um, stopping spread, which is what they're designed to do. Um, so I am grateful that our mitigation strategies and the plan appear to be having its intended effect. Regarding cleaning, I know this might be some confusing sometimes because often people hear about school districts that shut down an entire day to clean. I will say that recently, uh, Dr. Joseph Allen has been doing a whole lot more in terms of speaking to school districts, the Mass Association of School Committees and others about what he recommends. Somebody comes right out and says, it just simply, it simply does not make any sense um, because a better strategy is what we do and what we've done from the beginning is we disinfect every single day. Um, so we disinfect surfaces um, and uh, we disinfect our buses and we do this every single day. Um, and then, uh, and that's all surfaces um, and uh, all surfaces in all rooms and again, all buses daily. Uh, so our, we still remain uh, no one particular metric, no uh, single metric, rather it's in the red. So we look at community transmission and we look at school transmission. School transmission, um, if school transmission is likely, so let's review again how we would know. We don't just count uh, cases. We look at whether or not um, there is spread among close contacts. And that is not something that we have observed. And that's not a decision that an administrator makes, that's uh, health professionals make that determination. The Board of Health, school nurses, they speak also with DPH um, about what's happening, uh, who close contacts are and what we're seeing. So, and all, every single case is reported. Um, and then on the community transmission rates, so um, if, if the incidence per 100,000 people were to be 25 or greater, um, that's when the metrics that the school committee had been looking at, the Harvard Global Health Initiative says, you may wanna consider some sort of stay at home um, response. If testing positivity uh, is, is greater than 3%, um, that's another, those testing positivity was a red green. So uh, below 3% green, 3% or greater red. Um, so we don't see our incidence rates in the red. We don't see our testing positivity in the red. We don't have evidence of school transmission at this point. Um, we are closely monitoring the fact that clearly what we saw in the data on 11.5 were average daily incidence rates of five. Uh, on 11.12, we saw that increase to 10, so 100% increase. On 11.19, it increased 60% to 16. On 11.27, uh, that was essentially the Thanksgiving weeks, weekends data, that uh, increase was closer to about 30% from the previous week to 19.3. And then as I said, this past Thursday, it dipped only slightly to 18.6. We'll be paying close attention to the data that come out on Thursday. If that will be uh, exactly, am I right, two weeks past Thanksgiving, I think. Did I do that correctly? So we'll yeah. pay close attention to uh, the data that come out on Thursday. I'm yeah, happy to answer any questions about the data or just turn it over to the school committee for any discussion. And we, I was just going to remind folks, we do have time set aside um, on the uh, 14th, uh, should the data um, be trending differently uh, and warrant, you know, a more immediate attention. So we have set aside that time. Hey, Annie, this is what, you know, what's interesting here, and I, I want to read more about this because I know this is a global conversation. Even with the uptick over the last month or so, and I know this this next week will be very telling, as you said, as people uh, given the, the holiday, um, you see an increase of case count in our town, you see an increase of positivity in our county, but you don't see a commensurate increase in the schools. And I know there's those schools you list, those 22 schools are more than one county, but you don't see a commensurate increase across um, the schools. So. You know, that's something just to pay attention to. You, even, and this has been a long-going conversation in Europe and Britain, 
and I know the state has been advocating that uh, schools maybe are not the hubs of transmission. And you know, you're seeing it in our school, right? Uh, knock on wood, we haven't had transmission within our schools, but it's been pretty consistent over the last few weeks that you have one, two, three cases, even while the surrounding environment's going up. I, I just make that as an observation. So maybe it allows us to transition more readily into different phases, even while the county uh, transmission continues to be much higher than it was just a month ago. We haven't seen it translate to increased cases in any school, um, frankly, in our counties around us. We'll certainly continue to pay attention to not only what happened uh, in the county, what happens in other schools. I would say I appreciate again, I think part of what we're seeing is our faculty uh, and our students and our staff implementing these plans, right? They're just words on paper unless people implement those expectations. And so the adults and then the students are also adhering to those expectations and families are working with us. I think our nurses would say that, that when we ask for a family uh, member to pick up a student who may not be feeling well, um, we do err on the side of caution. That may be frustrating for some folks, but we appreciate the fact that our families have worked with us around that and also um, responded when we've made requests to uh, not congregate outside of a school or to make sure that we have masks on all the time. I believe all these things help. And so I really appreciate what everybody's doing. I agree. And I just, just a point to April as your team is going through this and thinking about this, it's, you know, we, we, we never, anything anybody calculates well is the opportunities lost and the, the small interactions lost, the social interactions lost. I mean, Tara asked the good questions about socially emotional, but our metric might be a survey, which is an inadequate capture, but it's probably the best we can do are grades, which again are probably a pretty poor capture. And that's, grades aren't the sole benefit of attending school, right? Um, and so I guess I would just ask us again to look at the data and the data seem to be saying, even as our counties are probably the highest, knock on wood, that they will ever be, we don't see it translated to in-school transmission, not in just in our school, but in any of the 22 schools that you've ranked in. So, I would advocate more for uh, opening back up Hopkins as much as we can, knowing that there's always risk, but we just, even in our most dire time right now, we're not seeing it translate to risk in the school. I do appreciate that. One thing I can say that the survey I sent out to students today, I do have 72 students who already responded and I sent it out earlier this morning. And a lot of what you're talking about, you can see there's uh, some questions that ask a sort of general question about mental health. And I think you guys might be looking for some more specific questions to develop, but they also have some opportunities to answer in anecdotal ways. And I think it does touch a lot upon uh, what you're mentioning about social interactions and missing a lot of that. So we'll continue to look through this and I'll, I'll share this uh, as well in the end. Um, but I think it is important to look at, and the kids have been pretty, pretty open and honest in the survey so far. Thanks, April. And that's probably the best we're going to get. I've said it before. We're never going to get a comparable metric of social, emotional, and, and costs of human development and child development uh, that compares on a quantitative level to the number of cases. But as long as these cases continue to be low, I think we can accept more opportunity to bring our kids back. And I have a question about contact tracing. Um, I think you've sent us in writing that um, only those contacts who are within six feet for longer than 15 minutes are contacted. Is that true? Am I stating it accurately? It's uh, within six feet for uh, 15 minutes. Ten, we. 15 minutes, 10 to 15 minutes, cumulatively over a 24 hour period. It's not okay. just one time. So it is cumulative. You have the, over a 24 hour period, correct. The question that I have is that if teachers and students are in a room that are designed to be having them sit six feet apart, uh, that is not within six feet. So the classroom is not contacted. Is that true? If we were confident, that folks had stayed in their seat for the entire day. So 
what the guidance clearly states, and actually Desi says, um, excuse me, Desi says, uh, now technically, originally they, they had said every student in a classroom would be considered a close contact and would be contacted. And with, as you just pointed out, now they've come out and said, well, if in fact a student was not within six feet, then in fact that student wouldn't be a close contact. However, I will say to the committee and to the community, it is unlikely that I would be entirely confident that everybody had remained glued to their chairs and not moved within six feet of one another, nor would I expect adults to have the observational capacity, and that's not an unfair criticism, I mean, I've been a teacher, to be able to remember exactly how many feet apart everyone was for how long during the course of the day. So we would most likely over, I, I can tell you not even most likely, we will over identify close contacts. That's just a given. So, and I don't, um... I don't know what the day-to-day -day activity at the school looks like, but I hope you're also considering um, all other sort of points of overlap, like yes. uh, bathrooms, hallways, um, yes. people uh, in faculty rooms. Um, yes. People are going to, yes. So, uh, yes. yeah, that just really struck me. We're designing our system to be, to be six feet apart, yet we're not contacting anyone unless they're explicitly within six feet so is anyone getting contacted at all what i'm hearing you say is we'll over identify close contacts yeah. and also i would like families to know that the general email i send to everybody which um thank you uh to one of the speakers earlier to miss pfeiffer for um acknowledging the transparency of the school department so the Department of Public Health and the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education are very clear. The only people should, who should ever be notified of that are the close contacts. I personally feel, given the fact that I publish these data every third, somewhere between Friday morning and Monday morning for everyone, um, it would annoy me if I were a parent and I got that in an email and nobody had told me prior to getting that chart. So we will always communicate. And when we, know, we will communicate remote, we will communicate in person. Um, and, but that email, what I call the general, everybody's informed of this, that this thing occurred. That general email will not go out until we have notified close contacts. So anybody who's getting that email should not be feeling, oh my gosh, are they gonna call me? The only thing that would make that untrue is if we had attempted to contact a close contact, more than one, just a message, but we emailed, we called, we called again, and we're not getting a response, then we're going to move ahead and, and inform people. But know that the steps would go, we work, the, the administrator, so nurse, we work on making sure, identifying all close contacts, uh, communicating with close contacts, and then I will send out a general email to the community and to families. So if you're getting that email and that's the first time you've, got, you've heard of it, you're not a close contact. And we will err on the side of over-identification. Great, thank you. I just wanna chime in and say thank you, Annie, for saying that, because that's something that was concerning to me. I can think of as a parent, um, not finding out if a child within the classroom, you know, within your child's classroom had been impacted by this, um, that it, might make people feel very uneasy. So I appreciate the over cautiousness in regards to contact because it, it is hard, especially I think at the elementary school um, to keep eyes on all those kids as they're moving, even something like Humera said, in the bathroom alone, even though we're limiting bathroom, um, number of kids in the bathroom that's hard to monitor and it's hard for a teacher to have to keep track of oh did so-and-so go to the bathroom with that kid or was it that that's too much so I appreciate that and then I also just wanted to point out in light of the email that you sent out in regards to the cases um, I really would like to acknowledge and appreciate the school nurses efforts um, and how quick they're able to do the contact tracing and their dedication to work hard crazy no matter when hours to get that completed to families that's their work right now is really, really, really challenging. 
Um, and I really appreciate school nurses in our district and everywhere right now, but I just, I just want them to know how much they're appreciated. I echo that. So our school nurses and our administrators, our building principals are working seven days a week. So when this happens, you find out on a weekend and then you just get it figured out. Um, so I, I echo that. They're doing phenomenal work. I just want to chime in. Uh, first, I just want to uh, shout out all the administrators and all the, the, the faculty and teachers uh, working in a school myself. I have seen the um, the efforts that folks have been putting in this year and it's incredible and it's exhausting. And um, I just want to tell everybody to keep up the good work. Um, I, Paul, I just want to say, I think your points are well taken. Um, I think my only point that I would make and I've made it before is that we're still just at 25% capacity at HA. So it stands that um, you know, uh, and I've said this before, I'd love to see that school more full. Um, but I do think we need to keep an eye on those next phases and keep looking toward moving um, forward. I think we have a pretty good understanding of what it would take for us to move back. Um, but I, I do want those phases as we move forward to be solid so that both teachers and, and families feel safe, but also that, that, that uh, students are getting the education that, that they, they deserve. Um, I, one of the points that was brought up earlier in, in the public comment was about um, hiring additional staff to, to support the remote learning. Annie, I didn't know if that's been a conversation that's taken place. And um, given that I, you know, I've always assumed that once we reopen to other phases, more and more kids are going to come back to Hopkins. Maybe that's not the case and we still have a bigger remote uh, population. So what's the thought around that or has there been a, given any thought to that? Yeah, I've actually mentioned that to uh, representatives of the HEA. Part of it is is just thinking through so exactly what would that look like for what purpose, um, and so what do I mean by that? If you're, it's a lot more complicated when subjects are specialized at the secondary level. It's 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 a bit more complicated, um, and uh, I am curious to hear from teachers about what makes sense to them. Um, some teachers, well all teachers feel uh, ownership over their students and um, many of them are, most if not all of them, are always asking themselves how do I figure this out because they want to reach everybody and reach them well. Um, so thinking through what do they need, what would what if there were a dedicated remote teacher, what precisely does that look like? Does that mean that students are no longer um, in a particular class? They're in a separate class or, so there's, the short answer is yes. I've certainly uh, brought this idea up to representation. The longer answer is uh, thinking about it and also not only, which nobody's suggesting, thinking about that. So that's, I think it's always important to ask ourselves, not just to focus immediately on what are possible strategies, but what is the desired outcome? So what precisely is it that we're trying to create or achieve? What exactly, precisely does that look like? Define that as clearly as possible. What's the current reality and the current resource allocation? And what's the gap between what we desire and what we currently are experiencing? And then which strategies would best close that gap. So that's the analysis that we're doing. A possible strategy would be this idea of having uh, dedicated instructional resources solely for remote learners, strictly for remote learners. That is a strategy that's absolutely worth consideration. Um, I would always go back to what precisely are we trying to achieve? What's the current reality that we're observing? What's the gap between those two things? And to what extent does the proposed strategy uh, close that gap? And are there others that may do that more effectively, as effectively, or are there a complementary suite of strategies that would get us where we want to be? I think um, if, the, if you're a member of the viewing public or um, uh, a repeat attendee in, in, uh, in these school committee meetings, you might be asking yourself, what the heck are they talking about? When did this come up? And actually it did come up in uh, executive session, the idea that we would potentially look at external resources to complement the need. But I just want to 
clarify something. Um, it came up in the context, uh, as Annie, you're rightfully suggesting that we look at um, what problem are we trying to solve? Um, and I just want to remind us that we, um, we're, we're, as a traditional school system, institution, we're used to doing things in very traditional ways. In, and today is a very non-traditional situation. Um, this situation where teachers are having to take ownership of their 30 students, 80% of whom might be in person, 20% um, remote or opposite, 80% at home, 20% in school. And, and we are in a situation where rightfully so in October, they're saying they're June tired. I can only imagine how tired they are now. Reopening just will continue. Reopening further exacerbates the issue. And I know there's domain specific issues. There's also social emotional sort of check-ins with students. There's also sort of um, uh, taking a, a tutoring or hourly approach. And I just ask us always to think creatively about how we might solve the issue. Throwing more money at a, situ at, at a problem isn't necessarily gonna fix the issue. Throwing more teachers at the situation isn't necessarily gonna fix the issue. But restructuring the way we work and for teachers to think creatively about how they may augment their capacity with a human resource that doesn't have to be in the building who could be patched in uh, remotely uh, might be a, a situation that could help their in-person learners. It might be a situation that can help their at home, at home learners. So I think that we shouldn't think about it as one or two remote teachers could get hired and they would service all the needs of remote learners. I think we just have to be super creative in, yeah, as you rightfully say, examining what is the problem we wish to solve and also then thinking about how we might solve it with an, an hourly or uh, contractual workforce that could augment our capacity. Thanks. Okay. Anything else on the review of data? No, the school committee does have a placeholder for data meetings on the 14th, just so the public also understands that those meetings are special meetings for data review only, that I understand the school committee set those times aside in the event that um, the data had uh, moved into a different shaded zone. But if something drastically does not occur, the school committee would not have that meeting necessarily, just like last week, the school committee did not have that meeting because all of these data are, I mean, I just collect the data and, re and republish it in the newsletter. It's all publicly available on Thursday evening. Right, thank you. Said another way, the school committee used to meet monthly and it is not opting to meet weekly because we love one another, although we do and we get along great. Um, but because of open meeting restrictions, we have to um, plan well ahead of time to be responsive to, a time, to, to our health situation, which is so evolving rapidly. So those are just placeholders. Never are we canceling meetings, and they should not be viewed as canceled meetings, but rather are we initiating a meeting because there's a dire need? Yep, well put. All right, um, I think we're good to move then to our last presentation item, which is the school committee acceptance of an iPad for Hadley Public Schools. So this activity is pretty um, uh, perfunctory, right? Just uh, full disclosure, we accepted the gift. Um, although technically the school committee has to officially accept it, but we'd also like to publicly thank uh, Ms. Rose for donating an iPad to Hadley Elementary School. It was very generous and kind of you, Ms. Rose. Thank you very much. And it does require a vote of the school committee to officially accept the gift for the elementary school. I would also like to thank Ms. Rose for the donation. I think um, 
we have made great strides in our technology plan and any support around that has always been welcomed. So uh, much appreciated that they uh, thought of us uh, and chose to go that route and donate the iPad. Any questions or comments before we vote? I make a motion to accept the iPad. Very generous donation. Thank you. Seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you very much. I like those topics. Yeah, those are good ones. <laughs> All right, we're going to skip the business manager reports and hold on to that for our pre-holiday uh, reports from Chris. That'll be fun. Uh, and move into the personnel reports. Uh. Yes, so we have hired uh, a long-term substitute um, to replace uh, an ES uh, educational support professional. Um, we have hired uh, one, two, three um, permanent educational support professional positions to replace positions, uh, resignations that we had had this year. And uh, we have um, done an internal transfer and uh, from uh, a support position to a long-term substitute in language arts at the middle school. That's all to report in personnel. Great. Any questions on the personnel report? Okay. All right, we do have school committee reports. Uh, um, for tonight. So Humera, you've got the collaborative. Any updates from there? Uh, no updates. Um, they're engaged in a search for the in, uh, executive director. Um, uh, and it's pretty much business as usual. Thank you. Uh, we will have upcoming negotiations with both units A and unit D. Um, and those will be scheduled after the new year. Policy committee. Uh, we reviewed a whole bunch of them in earlier meetings and sounds like you guys will meet again after the new year to amp back up again. <laughs> All right. Great. And then Paul, fields. Yeah, just a quick update. I, I did walk the fields with Carlos, uh, who was our designer with Brookshire Design. Just want to give a shout out to Brookshire Design. They've done a great job. I know Masta has done the work. They've also done an excellent job. I don't know if folks have been out to see it. You shouldn't technically walk on the field, so I'm not advocating that, but there's an asphalt path around it that's open to the public uh, off hours when school's not in, in session. And it's just, it's, a, it's really pretty out there. It's really nice. Um, the fields are looking great. They've been seeded. They'll be reseeded again in the spring. I'll say, you know, we, we'll do a more of a formal opening in the spring, hopefully when we can get together. Um, we have a new softball field, a new baseball field. There's still some work to be done. The, the fencing needs to go up. Uh, they'll reseed in the spring, as I said. Uh, it just really looks wonderful. They've done a great job. There's a lot of water management there. There's several settling ponds that take water away. Uh, and it's in a floodplain, so there was a lot of work about that. Um, the other thing to mention too, and I think I've mentioned this before, trying to work with local snowmobilers. I know that is a route that people take when they go to Cumbies to fill up for gas. Off of Middle Street now, there is a gate that's there. It's open, but it's black. And we're working with the town to uh, highlight it. I do not want a snowmobiler going through at fast speeds through there and not see that gate until it's too late. So we'll try to advertise it somehow with signage with reflective tape um, again, we're working with the town on that. Again, the gate's open. Um, and while I'm not condoning snowmobile use across school property, that's not technically authorized as far as I know. I know it happens, and so I don't want any accidents. Um, and I did, I'll let the school committee know, I did attend the select board meeting the other night where uh, the landowner on 113 Middle Street was asking for uh, basically a way to, to build an additional dwelling unit on their property and it was going to infringe on it just a slight bit of school property which frankly it's they already use it as a parking lot and our uh, solicitor had advised us that she was concerned about precedent she was concerned about future use of that land in case we needed it my what i said to the town was um it's already not been in use by the school that we designed our path that's there now uh, to avoid that area. 
and that I do not really consider that it's significant risk to the school if they were to use that as continued parking into the future. So I believe the select board, Annie, you were on that call, gave them um, basically some permission to continue using that. They didn't, they were conscious of uh, precedent and so they didn't um, give the, an easement to the, the family. I think it was more of a license to use the property for basically a limited time. Um, mm -hmm. So the, again, the fields are looking great and we'll plan for some celebration in the spring. Thanks for that update, Paul, and for circling back on the um, property discussion that we had started. Great. I will say they asked Andy to give a quick update uh, on the schools, which she did very well, and the select board was very complimentary of Andy and the school committee and just how the schools are, in general, how the schools are managing. So we got a, a nice shout out from several of the select board members. Great to hear. We, we appreciate that, and I know our our representative Jane Nevin Smith is in the meeting tonight and uh, we appreciate just the, the coordination and collaboration and um, open lines of communication. All right. Uh, and then finally, um, Ethan, finance. Anything happening with that since we last met? No, no, no updates, no meetings. Okay, great. Um, we do have one more action item, which is the approval of the minutes. We had two sets of minutes, October 15th and October 22nd. Any revisions or requests, clarifications needed around those minutes? Uh, none, but motion to um, approve the minutes. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Uh, we already accepted the gift, so just a reminder, we do have a placeholder for a meeting on the 14th at 5.30. Um, the purpose is to review the data. It is a special meeting um, that is absent public comment. We will cancel it should it not be um, needed to meet at that time. Um, and then instead, we are going to meet December 21st as part of our regular second meeting in December. We'll cover um, new business there as well as the business manager reports and that meeting is also at 530. Anything else for the good of the order before we adjourn? Oh. Motion to adjourn. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thanks everyone. Nice to see you. Good night. Good night. Have a